Welcome to worship, everyone. We are still pre-recording our services, which are available on YouTube and Facebook beginning at 9.30. Pay attention to emails and our Facebook page as we re-evaluate and hopefully return to in-person worship in the near future. Today is the first Sunday of the month, so we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. If you don't have some bread and juice with you already, you might want to go get some before you continue watching the service. A reminder that Dick Virgin leads a Sunday morning adult education class by Zoom at 9.30, and Bob is leading a Zoom Bible study on Wednesdays at two o'clock. That will be continuing the discussion on the women of the Bible. Today is our annual congregational meeting, which like last year, we will do live on Zoom instead of in person. You should have already received a Zoom link in your email. The meeting will start at 11 o'clock this morning. So if you started this worship service a little late today, you might want to pause it so that 11 o'clock you can join us on Zoom. One of the purposes of the annual meeting is to review the work and the mission of the church over the past year. You should have received an email copy of the annual report or hopefully had the time to come by the church already to pick one up. We will also be ordaining and installing new officers at the beginning of the Zoom meeting. As most of you know by now, Reverend Miley Palmer passed away at the end of January. A visitation and celebration of life service will be this Saturday, February 12th, at the First United Methodist Church, starting at 11 a.m. The service itself will begin at 2 o'clock and will be streamed live on Facebook and YouTube. In order to facilitate social distancing and safe COVID protocols, First Presbyterian Church has been asked if we would be a satellite site for the service. So we will be streaming the service on the screens in the sanctuary this Saturday at 2 o'clock. Of course, we will require everyone to wear masks during that time and space out in the sanctuary as much as possible. I also want to say the flowers this morning are given by the Myung Kim family in loving memory of Ki Kim. Let us worship God. We gather to worship God. Her spirit hovered over the chaos and created the beauty of this world. His voice spoke prophetic words of justice and neighborliness. Her wisdom guided us in paths of righteousness and their likeness became the image that's reflected in each one of us. We gather in the presence of this holy mystery, who is both revealed and hidden, mother of creation and human God with us. Living word, eternal spirit, and life-giving breath. Come amongst us now as we gather with listening hearts and thankful voices.
prayer of confession. Holy God, help us give up harsh words and, and use generous ones. Help us give up unhappiness and, and take, take up gratitude. Help us give up anger and, and practice gentleness and patience. Help us give up worry and, and embrace our trust in God. Help us give up judging others and, and discover Jesus within them. Help us give up words and, and fill ourselves with silence and a longing to listen. Friends, God is gracious and merciful. God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Believe that God loves you and makes you new. Amen. called many things which help us understand the character and intentions of God. The words we find in Psalm 145 are repeated at least a half a dozen times in the Bible and are especially helpful in seeing the way that God looks at us. It says, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and has compassion over all creation. What we call someone is important. The words we choose can, I, can either make someone feel important, valued, or it can make them feel marginalized, like an outsider. I remember the first time someone called me Mr. Wallenberg. I turned around thinking my dad must be standing behind me. Mr. was something that you said to an old person. In the first church I served, many of the older women whose husbands had died were still listed in the church directory as something like Mrs. John Smith. That's changed now. I'm glad nowadays we usually acknowledge everyone's first name. Now some of these ways of talking have to do with societal norms which change with every generation. Some of it has to do with the grammar that governs a particular language. And some of the changes come about, I hope, as we continually learn how to treat one another with greater compassion and respect. Today, I want to spend a few minutes thinking about how we talk about God. Specifically, I want to examine the pronouns we use to refer to God. These small little pronouns are important because they reveal some of our deepest convictions and beliefs about what God is like and how God relates to us. My grandmother, my father's mother, usually did the before meal praying when we were at their home. And she usually spoke what you might call a King James prayer. You know, the ones where the pronouns are all these and thous and thines. Interestingly, these old pronouns are gender neutral, whereas most of our English singular pronouns are now gendered. We say he and his, she and hers. By far the preferred 
nickname for God that my grandmother used was Father, which was the same word she used to refer to her husband, my grandfather. Not Honey, or Dear, or even Lewis, which was his name. It was Father. The word she used for her husband was the same word she used for God. Now, Father is a good biblical word for God. We know Jesus sometimes referred to God as Father, and the Lord's Prayer famously begins with the words, Our Father. So there's nothing wrong with referring to God as Father, so neither is there anything unbiblical about using these singular male pronouns for God. Our Father, He. But Father isn't the only name for God that we have in the Bible. Lord, Savior, Shepherd, Almighty, Creator, the Ancient of Days, these are all some of the names of God found in the Bible. Well, actually, to be more accurate, these are English translations of Hebrew and Greek names that we find in the Bible. The Hebrew word Elohim is usually translated as God in our Bibles. And that Hebrew word carries a male gender. The Hebrew word Adonai, usually translated as Lord in our Bibles. And that Hebrew word is gender neutral. The Hebrew word for the Spirit of God is Ruach, which carries a female gender. Some of the other images for God are male, such as king or father. Other images are feminine, like spirit or wisdom. So strictly following the biblical lead, the pronouns he and him, or she and her, are all appropriate for God. But it gets more complicated. In Genesis chapter 1, the first Hebrew word we find for God is Elohim. Now, in the Hebrew language, putting an im on the end of a word is like putting an s on the end of an English word. It makes it plural. So on the sixth day of creation, when it talks about us being made in God's image, the pronouns should really be plural. It should sound something like God, Elohim, said, let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness. So how should we refer to God? He, him, she, her, they, them? The answer is, confoundingly, yes, all of the above. The truth is that our human language falls short of describing the totality of existence. Maybe that's why we find so much poetry in the Bible. Poetry is the language of metaphor and symbolism. In poetry, words point beyond themselves to something that's greater than what our language allows. So why are we so anxious to label God's world in strict categories. Some of the biggest differences between biblical translations is in their willingness to reflect the gender expansiveness of God and humanity. The first edition of what was called an inclusive language Bible was published almost 40 years ago. It was a project of the National Council of Churches, and it provoked a huge backlash. Over 10,000 letters, old-fashioned snail mail letters, were written protesting this translation that trying to find a more inclusive vocabulary for God and the human family. But times have changed. A couple years ago, the Southern Baptists 
not known for their support of such inclusive language projects, approved a new Bible translation that uses some of the same inclusive words that they rejected only a few years earlier. Maybe we should learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters that names are holy. You might remember the story in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses comes across a burning bush out of which God speaks to him. And in that conversation, Moses asks God, what's your name? And God says, well, this is where it gets tricky. Because the word that God speaks is notoriously difficult to either pronounce or translate. If we are transliterating the Hebrew, we usually say Yahweh. If we're translating it into English, we usually say, I am that I am. But again, the gender, tense, and translation of this Hebrew word is obscure. For many Jews, this name of God is so holy that it's never spoken out loud. Maybe we should stop trying to refer to God in ways that are simply the most convenient or least confusing. The biblical writers certainly don't seem very eager to make the language about God convenient. And maybe it shouldn't be. Doesn't it make sense that something which defies our full understanding ought to have a name that reflects some amount of mystery? And what about us? If God created us in God's own self-image, don't we carry some of that mystery within ourselves? What makes us think that we should be so easily pigeonholed into neat little categories? Why are we so hesitant to use expansive language to express the complexity and the mystery of human life? As Psalm 139 says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. How many people in our world today are trying to express the complexity of their own identity in ways that parallel our attempts to find the right language about God? God, it turns out, has a rather fluid identity. So doesn't it make sense that many of us in the human community, would discover that same diversity amongst ourselves. Just as we need to respect the diversity of pronouns for God in the Bible, perhaps we too can give our friends, children, partners, co-workers, the space to find the language that identifies themselves in ways that are authentic and reflective of the image of God in which they are created. Now this may require us to learn new ways of speaking about and to one another, but if we can do that for God, we can do that for one another. What we learn from the Bible is that our language of God is always limited by human vocabulary. God's own identity refuses to be constricted by our inadequate names for God. Likewise, as God's children, we should keep our imaginations open to new ways of constructing our own identities out of the language we have been given to work with. May we all find the grace to speak with one another with generous words and expansive images. May all our names 
communicate the same compassion, love, and generosity that God has for us. Amen. this table for a meal, we are reminded of God's vision for shalom in the world. In this place, no one is a stranger. No one is an enemy. Instead, we are all beloved children of God, united by the extravagance of God's loving grace. Let us join together in our communion litany. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right for us to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we give you thanks for your love which is so deep and wide. We thank you for the beauty of your creation and in the people that we see every day. Draw us into your heart and help us to be aware of your presence with us today and every day, no matter where we are on our life's journey. Most of all, we thank you for your extravagant love, which comes to us in the person of Jesus. 
As we share this meal, remind us of the ways in which he shared himself with others, the way he cared for the sick, the way he forgave sinners and made friends with those who are overlooked and cast out. May this meal bring us closer to him and to all your children. Gracious God, breathe your spirit upon us. Fill us completely so that we might become your bold and faithful disciples. And now hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Every time you do this, do so remembering me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, do so, remembering me. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. join together in prayer. Through the generosity of this holy meal, O God, may your love spill out into the whole world. Give us the courage to speak your truth, to seek your justice, and to live out your love. Amen.